So hello everyone. There is only two thumb rules that I normally have in my lectures. It should not be a monologue. That means it's not only me who is speaking for, a year, uh, for an hour and a half. And when we walk out of this room, there should be also some takeaway for me, yeah? So if you feel that I'm here just to give you this something amazing which I have gained over 14 years, you are wrong. I'm also here to gain something from you in terms of idea or, or what do you think? Because we have been working or I have been working from last 14 years and somehow I, my view, my opinion are very shallow now, yeah? It's very focused to some topics. You as somebody very fresh can uh, bring in some new ideas, uh, something, a different perspective. So please, please, please don't make it a monologue, yeah? Feel free to ask, interrupt me whenever you want. And although I come from BSF, I'm, as you can see, yeah? I'm, I'm in the casuals, yeah? And since I have a tag of data scientist, so I can wear jeans, I can wear, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah? <laughs> so, so please make it as informal as possible, yeah? Um, my colleague was here last week, so I think she would have already given you a brief about BSF. If not, please cross the river. You have BSF there, yeah? It's, it's, it's just there. And we have exhibitions, or you can do a planned tour every Saturday. Uh, there are some time slots. You can book it, and you can have a tour of the plant, yeah? I would say it's a really nice thing to do because uh, the company is 150 years old. It has survived the world wars, yeah? And, and it's the largest integrated chemical site in the world. Seven kilometer long, four kilometer wide. And BSF as a company is larger, th larger than the company which is in second place and third place combined together. We claim that whatever you see around you, 60% of that comes from BSF. The color, the, the essence that you eat, the flavors that you eat, chocolate flavor, strawberry, or whatever you eat, might be made at BSF, yeah? So, yeah, it's nice to be next to BSF. I'm not sure if how much pollution we are doing it, but uh, the water that we, the water that leaves our plant is more pure or it is more clean than the normal water in Rhine. So, you will find a lot of big fishes at the at the river, you know, uh, you can see it, you can Google it, you have this big catfishes which are there. Uh, data science and sustainability, yeah? So, it's, it's amazing uh, combination. Have anybody of you thought about it? No monologue. Have any of you thought about it? The answer could be also no, yeah? Okay, let's see if I can change your attitude in one and a half hour, yeah? If, if I can make you speak. So, how many of you have seen this? Anybody has been at BSF? No, no? <laughs> really? <laughs> so, you have seen it. Do you know what is this? Perfect. Thank you, thanks. Reporting always helps, thank you. So I'm just projecting that, this stuff here on the screen, yeah? And this is very essential for the guys in BSF because it talks about our purpose, why we are, yeah? And if you see, there are three circles, social, environmental, and economic. And the fun part is that, as you can see here, all of these are very important for us. If, if I make it like this and try to rotate, it will not, it will fall. You have to have an equal balance of all these ingredients. So if you are doing really good economically and you are not doing good with environmental or social, the wheel doesn't rotate, it falls. The purpose and it's mentioned in our, our purpose. If you go to the website of BSF, you can see there, we clearly say that we create chemistry for a sustainable future. Now, I cannot talk as a company of sustainability if 
I can't make money out of it. So I can't go to my shareholders and say, ah, you know what, we are the most sustainable company and we are really environmental friendly, uh, so this year we can't give you uh, much a profit, yeah? That's the reason why we say we have to keep a balance between environment, economics, and society. And what I also try to do when I was planning for this uh, lecture was that, I, I, and this is not what they would have thought, I'm not guaranteeing it, yeah? But I just wanted to have a look at what are the different principles of sustainability. When we talk of sustainability, when we talk of sustainability science, what are the different key ingredients? And since I come from India, um, I, I have this love for Vedas, I also try to find out what historically human beings were talking about sustainability. So the best part or the most funny part is that what we are talking now has been there from last thousand years. Our, our generations, they've been talking the same thing. They've been talking about integrity, they've been talking about precautions, they've been talking about in integration. They have been talking about inter interconnections. And somehow, we at BSF are trying to also achieve the six principles of sustainability. When I give you an example of this plant, which is here, just across the river, it is the largest integrated plant for any chemical site or for a chemical company. In German, we call it as a Verbund concept, yeah? So whatever is the output or the, or the byproduct of a furnace is the input for the next step. So we try to consume everything that we are producing as a by, byproduct. And that is what is interconnectivity. That is what you, you talk about sustainability, that you try to use everything that is coming out in a way or other. So I'm, I, as I say that I'm not claiming that when we were desc describing these three principles or these three values, uh, the principles of sustainability was copied as it is, but somewhere the founders or the, or the guys at, at the management level thought of these principles of sustainability. Now a very open question to all of you, how many of you think that sustainability is very, very crucial or it should be implemented or it should be followed to save the, the planet. Come on, you can raise your hands, yeah? I do still do not see some of the people there might be chatting or seeing something on the screen, but my question was how many of you feel that it's very important to have sustainability to save the earth? I think most of us agree to that. And how many of you feel that it's much more important than that to save human beings? Is sustainability important to save human race? Yeah, it's obvious, yeah. There's no brainer for sure, yeah. But I still see people not still confused, yeah, as trying to raise their hand or... Is... The first question was, if you ask me, I think we all are confused. Planet will be there. Whatever you do, you destroy the whole, uh, whole eco ecosystem, planet will be still there. Planet might not be conducive to you. It would not be conducive to a human race, but planet would be still there. The planet would be there without human beings. So please don't give this bullshit that we want to save planet. Yeah? Don't, <laughs> this planet has been there, yeah? Whether you burn all the trees, you, you, you destroy all the waters, planet would be still be there. Even if you, like I think Trump said that, how do you, st uh, how do you stop the, the, this hurricane, yeah? Put a nuclear bomb, yeah? It will stop, yeah? So <laughs> that was his suggestion, I think, when, when there was a, a hurricane in, um, in Barbados. Planet will be there. Might be without human race. So sustainability is more important for human race, yeah? Not for the planet. Yeah, for sure we always see our perspective, how human beings will survive, yeah? How, what will happen to human beings if, if we are not sustainable or if we don't take care of the planet? Because the ecological system will go for a toss. So what I'm trying to bring a point here is that the principles of, of sustainability has been always there people have been trying to follow it. But 
There is a very interesting TED talk uh, from a guy or, or a farmer from, uh, from Thailand. And I, I can't recollect his name, but he was, he, his, his theme was that he doesn't want to study. Because the more you study, the more you destroy the earth. I have to recollect his name, so I, I can't recollect it. So his, his logic was that we learn to do farming and then become, we become a chemical engineer, and now we have lots of fertilizers and pesticides to produce more and more crops. But at the end of the day, we are destroying the soil. So you want to have a bio food or bio vegetables, but it was always bio. It's human being who started putting fertilizers. It's human being who started putting pesticides and herbicides. So what? What is, the, what is the basic trait or what is the basic idea which I would want to put forward to you is that if we look at our roots, if we go back to our basics, we human being, we are always a sustainable society. Over the period of time, for our convenience, for our ease in life, we have destroyed this. The biggest example is plastic. Now, now we talk of plastic. There should be no single use of plastic or all these campaigns. But we could have done it long ago. There are 500 million t-shirts that are produced every year. 500 million t-shirts that are produced every year. But still, we have people who don't have clothes to wear. We talk of dieting, yeah? We talk about, ah, we should do a diet, food dieting, and we should be slim and fit. Why don't we talk of fashion dieting? Why don't we say that for the next one year, I will not buy another pair of jeans or another pair of t-shirts? Convenience. Everything is fine and good when it doesn't come to you personally. And that convenience has created all this problem. So having <laughs> that as a, as a background, uh, I too am doing that, so it's not that uh, I'm the one who is most sustainable and you know, I, I too buy t-shirts and I too buy jeans and, and the cotton industry or the clothing industry are one of the most polluting industry in the world. The amount of water they need and the amount of bleaches that they use and even after using those water, when they leave this water outside, it destroys the soil, yeah? It makes the soils more acidic and you can't grow anything in those soils. 15, 20 years ago, there was a trend, yeah? Let's, let's push this pollution to the other part of the world, yeah? <laughs> but the earth is, is round and, and the air that we smoke, uh, the, the air we, uh, that we smell or we breathe, breathe is, is, is common for all of us. So if something is happening in Indonesia or in, if the t-shirts are getting made in Thailand, it will reach someday to Germany also. And we were not thinking about that. So the human nature is very easy. We try to avoid the problem until it comes very, very close to you. So with that background, <laughs> uh, let's move forward and try to uh, discuss what, uh, what is data science and sustainability. Yeah? So data science is basically a multidisciplinary blend of data interfaces, algorithms, and technology. And in principle, we use data science to solve complex problems. Yeah? Um, it's nothing new, yeah? This has been there from 60s, yeah? We have algorithms, we have uh, artificial intelligence algorithms in 60s, yeah? But at that time, we didn't have the infrastructure, technology to implement it. Now we have the resources, now we have the, the need for these technologies, and we are using it. Now, sustainability, uh, I don't want to define it. I think you already know better than me. Uh, I don't have a background as such in sustainability. But many times I have seen people confusing with sustainability and resilience. Have you guys also sometimes come across these two different words? Sustainability and resilience. You want to make smart cities. You want to make uh, homes which uh, doesn't get affected by, by, by flood or by earthquake. Is this sustainability? Or is it resilience? I come from India, yeah. So this, this, 
And this is very confusing in India, yeah? I think by now you know it. If no, please watch the YouTube video, yeah? It's really nicely explained, what does it mean? No? Resilience, sustainability, difference. I have to talk to your professor, yeah? This would be the question in your exam or some mock paper, yeah? Resilience is basic, yeah, please. Perfect. Did you all hear what she said? Pretty much. Uh, if he can hear, then I think it's, it's, it's good, yeah. Exactly, that's the definition of resilience, yeah? To, to, to recover from something traumatic or bad that has happened. And by definition or by nature, Earth is resilient to changes. Global warming is an example of Earth's resilience towards the climate changes. But Earth is not sustainable. Because the resources that are there, you're consuming it, and it cannot be, it is not coming back to you, yeah? So if, if the trees are gone, or if the, if the water is gone, it's gone. So by nature, by nature, the nature is resilient. But it's not sustainable. So please do not get confused with resilience and sustainability. When you talk of smart uh, city or smart houses or uh, no, uh, flood-proof houses, we are talking about resilience. We are not talking about sustainability. And I dare to say this, that may, most of the guys, even in the industry, who are working on applied sustainability, they confuse between these two terms. They confuse that by making a resilient system, they are being sustainable. No. Resilience will never bring back or will be sustainable. Sustainability is how do make, you make sure that, that a particular thing is used in an economic, social, and, in, and environmental way. The best possible case. That's resilience. That's sustainability. So. Uh, the way, the speed at which we are doing, yeah, we are progressing, we are developing, we are, we are building cities, we are building infrastructure, we are, we are building bridges, we are building everything around us, is too much for, for our in ecosystem to take. It's very difficult for the ecosystem to, to, to take this load of, of the development. The only analog that I wanted to uh, also give you here is that sustainability has definite different def definition from different perspective. For a company like BASF or for industry, sustainability also means how we can make sure that whatever manufacturing processes we have is, is more sustainable. In my role in BASF, most of the time I'm related to financial projects, yeah? So I, I do finance projects at BASF. And we do have sustainability also in finance. How do I make finance department more sustainable? Whatever we are spending the money we are investing from on behalf of VSF, how do we make sure that they are, those are sustainable? So different stakeholders have a different definition of sustainability. You could, could have your own definition. By the way, what is your definition of, or what is your take on sustainability? What do you think? Why do you want to, to have sustainability in your life or Guys, come on. It's already 25 minutes. You should be, by now, it should not be monologue, eh? No? Why, 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 why you are interested in this topic? What brings you to this lecture or the other classes on sustainability? Credit? By the way, this is really an amazing topic for the next 10 years. If you want to make a career in sustainability, the next 10 years is yours, believe me. And I think that's the reason why I'm here. I'm trying to promote myself also in sustainability. Nevertheless, I know it will still take me another hour to make you speak, but most of us complain that we cannot change the process or we cannot change the way we are manufacturing something or we are producing something because it, this is how it was done. Sustainability was not by design. Now we are trying to impose sustainability on existing processes. So when we did the first industrial revolution, we talked about a steam engine, yeah? We talked about a steam engine, we talked about uh, uh, the manual works were taken off and we were doing the steam, uh, you know, we brought in steam engine. 
We never thought about sustainability at that time. The second industrial revolution also brought about electricity. Yeah? So we started with this electricity. Might be that electricity was produced by coal or charcoal or with fossil you know, um, stuff. But we never talk of sustainability there. Same for the third generation of uh, industrial revol revolution. But right now is the opportunity. We are starting our fourth generation or fourth revolution. We are talking about industry 4.0. And we should talk about sustainability by design. We should make sure that whatever we design, the new plants, the new processes, sustainability should be embedded as design. It should not be that we, are, we will do everything and after making the plant or producing, making a process, at the end we'll say, ah, oh, by the way, we also need to consider about sustainability. This is the golden opportunity for all of us. And that's where we, as a data scientist, come into picture. Because with the tools and techniques that we have in data science, we can simulate, we can collect, we can, we can do the regression of those processes and tell them how, what will happen if we do scenario one, scenario two, and how it will impact. That's where I come from. That's where I help my, my colleagues and the colleague who was here last week to predict how much carbon footprint we will have when we do a particular process. That's the connection between data science and sustainability. Because many things are getting automated. And, when, and if you ask me, at times automation is good. It's good because you can set up the benchmark, you can keep the regulation in check. Because you feed the system with a strict regulation criteria or KPIs, and the system will only perform or deliver what is mentioned there. If you, if you leave it to a human being, might be something will change. They might you know, change the parameters, change the KPIs. That's where I come from. That's, that's, the, that's the background where, where, where we, we try to do it. So in most of the companies, how many of you, sorry guys, I, I keep asking you guys, yeah? But, how many of you prefer to have bio, bio or bio food and you don't, you, you, you would pay 10 cent extra, 20 cent extra or one euro extra for a, a packet which has a bio label? Most of us, yeah, if, if, if we have a good uh, stipend or money we are getting from the college then we can buy it, yeah? And that's where the company are interested into. None of the business can do sustainability for the sake of sustainability. So now most of the companies have a department or people or, or group of people who are doing sustainability analytics. For example, if I buy a potato, for example, if I buy a, a, a kilo of potatoes, the companies are now putting a label there to produce one kilo of potatoes, what was the carbon footprint huh? or how much, how much water was used. Because it can happen that the per hectare production of potato in Germany is much, much more than what it is in, say, for example, one of the Asian countries. Although it would be produced at much cheaper labor and the other cost would be lesser there, but the amount of potato or the productivity is much more here. So the amount of carbon or for the amount of water that would be used in Asia, for example, and in Germany would compensate for that. And that's the reason why people are also interested into knowing where my food or where the crop was grown, where this t-shirt was you know, manufactured, to know exactly these all informations. We at BSF are also doing that. For example, we make the, the, the first picture that you saw of a, of a pig was basically, we have a project called AG Balance, which I will talk in detail uh, later. There we make food for these pigs. And when we make this food for pigs, we have to buy barley, we have to buy, say for example, cereals. And we decide depending upon how much is the sustainability factors which we are buying in to calculate how much is the sustainability quotient for this particular product. And that is where we come into picture and we do this all analysis. 
So, most of the companies are having a sustainability analytics as, as one of the key drivers to manufacture more sustainable and more, more eco-friendly products. And this is also now possible because of the advancement in technology, because of the internet of things and because of the, all the infrastructure that we have around us. That is one of the drivers that we have. As I, as I told you already that uh, big data or, or data science is helping to, to keep uh, better regulations. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can force it. Means what I have seen in, in the last five, seven years is that at BSF also, uh, we have different subsidiaries. Yeah? We have company or we have plants at different locations. And each of these locations has their own parameters. Yeah? So the, the colleagues at that particular location have their own parameters, how it should be done and what should be done. There was no harmonized process across. Yeah? So I, being a human being, I'm, at, I, I'm, 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 I'm for example, in the US, and I follow whatever metrics, you know, as a, as a person I feel correct. Yeah? There are always many times a gut feeling. Yeah? You as an expert, you say, no, I should use this much of barley from this particular country, and I should mix it with this much of water, and by the way, I should use sunflower, and not this. There was no harmonized or standard process. With big data and with, with, with Internet of Things and all these tools that we have, now we are in a position where we can harmonize it. We said this is the standard process, and the system will only accept these values irrespective of where you are doing it. So regulations and, yeah, means in the past, means even we did at BSF, we, have, we, we, we moved many of our plants into China because the regulations were not so strict there at that time. Yeah, so, so what we cannot produce in, in Europe can be produced in, in, for example, Asia. But now with globalization and every country putting a very strict you know, benchmark and KPIs, we, we have to follow that. So it's not only the companies, but also the government who are enforcing. So we have a lot of government agencies who are enforcing these KPIs and, regulate, and they collect the regulatory data from all these companies, do audit, and then they try to enforce those regulations. So this is one of the example, uh, and, and the colleague who was, who was here last week, I, I was working with her team to, to develop this solution. Yeah. Um, as I said, that we, we make uh, this uh, pork feed, yeah, we make the, uh, the animal protein, uh, which, yeah, so it's like that uh, you have a piglet and you want to, after say six months, you want to have a thousand kg of a pig to, to know, with carcass. How do you feed it, yeah? So me and my colleagues, we develop an application where you can feed, okay, this piglet is this days old now, and you want to have him slaughtered in say six months or eight months, how do you feed him? Yeah, I know, <laughs> but that's how it is. Yeah, you have to plan it, how, at, at what age or at what level you want to slaughter him. And based on that, you know, different parameters, we do the combination of the different ingredients. So, oh, okay, after eight months, we want him to be uh, like 1,000 1, kg, so he needs to be fed, fed with this protein and this type of food for this many days and the next one and the next one and the next one. And we give these options to the farmer who is growing this pig, yeah? So he has a choice, he can put it, all these details. And at the end of this simulation, he can also see how much it will cost him, how much would be the carbon footprint, sustainability, how much water he needs, everything in one place. Now, what he can do, which is a new trend that he can go to the market or to all these big suppliers whom he sells this, uh, this pork, saying that this pork was breeded into a sustainable environment with this much of sustainability quotient. This one is the next one, this is one is the next one. And he gets a different prices or margin for different animals. So as I said that we, we wanted to bring uh, sustainability into practice and we have this project which we, which we, where we where we are trying to combine the agricultural world, the nutrition world, and with the help of data science, we are generating and simulating this. It's very easy said than done, yeah? I also have to take into consideration two-fold optimization. So it's not only the optimization of from where I get the barley or how much is the sustainability factor, I also have to take into consideration the cost. 
So if 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 I'm a, I go to supermarket and I have two two different varieties of you know, pork meat, and if it costs me two euro difference, I might not be so interested to buy this two euro costly thing. Yeah. So you have to also find out this willingness to pay. Yeah. I mean, most of the MBA student would be knowing this word. How much a customer is willing to pay for this sustainability factor. So we did a lot of iteration with our different customers and with different vendors, also with different farmers to, to find out this sweet spot where, where, uh, where we have this willingness to pay in the margin. Uh, very genuine question, very rightly uh, put that why should I, I as a customer, why should I pay for something which is costly? I don't give a damn to sustainability and all this thing for sure. But whenever something new comes in the market, you have this, until unless it, it becomes a commodity, we as a company has to earn the amount of money which we have invested into research and development of that product. Be it iPhone, be your plasma TV, be it whatever you see, when it is launched, it's costly. It takes time to have it commoditized, yeah? You still, Apple is a different example, but, but if you see, look at the smartphones, for example, when it was launched at the start, it was really costly. But now you can buy all, you know, there's no difference between a normal phone and a smartphone price. It has gone drastically down. Um, means I don't know if, if any of you have had a, or your dad, I will say, had a laptop with 512 MB RAM or, or 256 MB RAM. Had anybody had this weird system? And then, do you know how much your dad would have paid for that laptop? I mean, because when I was in college, in my engineering college, and I got a, a, a PC box uh, with one GB RAM, the whole university or the college was at my home to play NFS, yeah? Because that was the highest RAM that was available at that time for us. But now, when you buy a laptop, I don't think you get a laptop with two GB RAM. The default is four or six GB. But at that time, because of the price, and as I said, that it takes time. It will take time, and for sure there would be a day where you will only buy bio product because there would be only bio product in the market. But it needs time because the companies are, as I said, that no, none of the companies are doing <laughs> sustainability for the sake of sustainability, yeah? It has to have a business or, a, or, or some economics is involved there. Until unless we, we reach at this position where we can commoditize the whole thing, it is the way it is. So right now, sustainability in principle or as per the literature or with a different expert, is only catering to a particular uh, layer of society who can afford to have sustainable or bio product. It's not for everyone. I agree to that, but that's, that's what I foresee, yeah. Because the market demand would be shrinking and everybody would like to have bio product. You still get cheaper bio product now also, yeah. So if you go to, for example, Aldi, uh, uh, if you go to Rayway, you will see the difference in price. And, and, and what I, I learned or heard from some of my friends here is also that even in the supermarkets, you have this categorization, yeah? Rayway is a little costlier than Aldi, Aldi is a little costlier than Edika, for example, Lidl, and, and, and so on and so forth. All of them are seeing bio products. But if you buy the same cheese, for example, not the same brand, but bio cheese from Aldi and from Rayway, you might end up paying some cents more. So, you know, it, it, it will take time. It will take time for, to be there. Can you buy a Nokia 3310 phone now? Or can you buy a phone, Miss, you can, but can you buy easily a non-touch touch screen phone? Look at the market, how it has driven, yeah? Now you, by default, you get touch screen, yeah? But when touch screen was launched, whoa, amazing, yeah? It takes time. But for the companies or for the farmer, it's not only banana, that he planted banana and it's ready and you do it. He waters it, he harvests it. And, and the most or the biggest industry which will get impacted with automation, with artificial intelligence is agriculture. So it can happen that right now you are using 10 people to harvest this banana, which per hour is costing you 34 euro or 35 euro, would be done by a robot, which cost you only five euro. Then the total price of banana will come down, for sure. That's how it is, that's how it is. That's how it is, that 
when something becomes commodity, the prices goes down. But when it comes into market as an innovative product, it takes some time because there is a lot of investment done on research and R&D, be it food, be it whatever. Let's look at, let's, for example, KFC burger, yeah? Now you have thousands of such burger uh, places, but at when, it was, when it was launched, it was, a, it was a special burger with a special recipe and people were eager to pay for it. But now you say, why should I go for KFC when I can get this in? Uh, so for sure, there is a brand value which you always pay for, but, but in general, it takes time, be it banana or be it uh, LED screens. Any other questions, discussions? No, yes, okay. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we have this product where we, uh, we try to make uh, animal protein in more sustainable way and yeah, it's, it's very popular now, it's, it's, it's being used. Um, when we were doing this project, project uh, when we were trying to build this application, we had a lot of round of iteration with the farmers, yeah? And, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to point to you. And most of the farmers were asking me th us the same question, yeah? What is in for him, yeah? Because why should he pay for a tool or for an app when he has to, har uh, to, 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 to have a pig, uh, has to grow a pig, yeah? Or to, has to have a harvest the pig, yeah? Why should he pay for an app? What is in for him, yeah? So what we try to, uh, you know, um, give him is that when you produce a, a pork meat or when you produce pork with sustainability factors into consideration, you can put this green tag there and price it differently. And that would be your margin. That would be people are ready to, or at least this particular section of society is ready to pay a euro or two more for having a more sustainable meat. For sure, Sustainability also need lots of lot of marketing, yeah. So there was always a lot of campaign going around that if you have a you know, sustainable food and this will happen, that will happen. But that is the price difference which he can earn when he has to when he he sells a pork meat which was you know grown into a sustainable way. So what we also was that what we realized over the time period was that the value that this particular tool or this, uh, this application was bringing in to, to BSF, to the partners, to the, to the farmers was, we had the reduced cost to harvest such, such, such animals. We have increased in value and in turn increase in sale because people were eager to buy more sustainable food. You know, vegan for example, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's now a trend, everybody wants to eat vegan food, yeah? But why should I pay more for having a vegan food? Although I'm not getting lactose from the milk. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's in a way, if, if you ask a healthy person who is not so um, thinking about uh, all this, he will say, oh, I would like to have more of milk with lactose if he doesn't have an allergy, for example. But he, we end up paying more for vegan foods than what you would have bought, paid for a normal you know, uh, recipe. The, the value, yeah? What, what is demand. So we were able to bring this all and we were also able to reduce the risk because as I said, with climate changes and, 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 and not so predictable weather and all this thing, we were able to put this in, in, in there. Means I'm not going in detail of the solution because too, it will then take you uh, too technical to that. But what I'm trying to bring here is that company like BSF are highly committed to topics like sustainability not only as a purpose, but also because that's the new area for economics also. We all have to somehow go to, to become a sustainable firm. This is really interesting, yeah? So la last year, last year, BSF suffered 250 million euros of, we, were, we, we, we had a loss because this river that you see now next to you didn't have sufficient water. The river next to you didn't have sufficient water and most of our products in Europe goes via the water vessels. So we buy the raw materials or we get the raw materials to the plant via the barge or the cargo and vice versa we send the finished product to Asia or to the other part of Europe via, via the barges. 
now whom should i we should blame <laughs> is it is it sustainability is it poor planning so one of the challenge that we have as a company is also logistic yeah we make so many products and how do we ship it across the answer could be ah why didn't you uh, had a flight and you could have moved it it would be costly for us so it's not only the transport that we are talking of over the, over the rhine river but also the the cool water that we you know take it for 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 our furnaces so what we did with with our team was that we did a study or uh, we put some uh, data science concept to find out at what time what would be the level of water in rhine river so we were able to forecast for the next 6 months how much would be the water level in rhine river and based on our forecast now the supply chain guys they can plan how should the product would be moved from the plant or to the plant because we had to last year in september we had to shut down some of our our, our production because we were we were not getting the raw materials so with help of uh, us or our team we were able to, uh, we are now able to predict the water level in rhine river for sure we need lot of market indicators but we are able to predict the water level in rhine river and this helps our supply chain guys to to predict how to plan the supply chain yeah how to plan the transportation of uh, materials from ludic saf and to other part of the world this also comes as a sustainability because at the end of the day our production plant if it closes we lose business and we never thought of this yeah we never thought that rhine the the water river will cause such a big loss yeah this is a big number yeah this is a big number and this is what we feel there could be more consequence because it's not only the production of that those months or that those quarter but it's a chain reaction yeah it impacts the next cycle next cycle and everything goes down you might also lose customer because available to promise yeah so whatever customers we had who needs this kind of material at a particular time would be now buying it from someone else for example so this is the estimated loss that we had it could be more also this is what we are doing with our team we are trying to predict the water level for example for the next 6 months so that the supply chain colleagues can plan how to do transport there is one uh, this blank slide but uh, we had a project called maglish yeah if you you are on you have iphone or for example you have android phone you can go to google play or to app store and look for uh, this word this is again another app that we have developed and with this app a farmer can know or he can get recommendations and suggestions in his area so for example if i'm here at Ma in manheim and i'm a farmer i want to know the humidity i want to know the, the the weather forecast i want to know what is currently the situation of this land or soil is it acidic basic what kind of crop i should grow up, grow all the agronomical informations is available here along with that we also provide you the information that if you are growing for example potato by the time your crop is ready for harvest what is the expected range of price that you will get for each kilo of potato for example so that you can plan your budget or your your finance and the yield from this particular farming so it's a mobile app yeah it's, it's, it's anybody can download it and register it and we give all this you know uh, environmental and ecological informations on that the next one which i wanted to talk and this is really a <laughs> i saw a video on facebook and this is this is kind of interview from a ex chief editor of vogue ma magazine of india and she she was talking about the fashion diet that i told you just couple of seconds ago or minutes ago i don't agree to everything that she says but if you guys have uh, uh, you know some time uh, you know you can you can go to you know or on the youtube and just type fashion diet yeah i really like the the idea what she was trying to bring in yeah about the fashion diet yeah we 
because most of the time we we don't see the obvious thing we don't see which are the factors or which are the which industry or which particular uh, processes or product are producing more and more you know un unhealthy things and clothing or cloth is one of the biggest the amount of water that we waste with with dyeing of the uh, clothes or washing it is tremendous so have a look at it yeah means um, i always say this that um, uh, it's, it's, it's from Julius, uh, it's from uh, Merchant of Venice, um, Act 2, Scene 2, I think, where the, uh, the, 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 where, I don't know if, have you read Merchant of Venice? Uh, it's not that you missed something, it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> there is this uh, uh, narration there where they say that it's easy to preach or it's easy to teach than to be among the audience, yeah? So it's easy to talk about sustainability, it's easy to talk about what should be done, what should not be done, but it's difficult to follow. If you really want to make an impact, if you really want to have sustainability, it starts with you. It doesn't mean that you need to wear dirty clothes, yeah? You should wash your clothes for sure, yeah? You don't save <laughs> water with that. But yeah, when you, do, when you say I will only eat once a day or might be I will fast for a day and why not for the clothes? 500, 5 billion t-shirt, oh my God. It's, it's amazing every year, yeah? But the worst part is that I still read a lot of articles where people say, or the reporter says that, oh, there are a lot of poor people who can't afford a cloth. Where does this go? Might be in our cabinets, yeah? They're lying there for... Miss, you can buy a T-shirt at a cheaper price than coffee. And that shows the value, how it would be produced. If you are buying a, a T-shirt at a cheaper price than coffee, it clearly means how it would have been produced, yeah? I mean, I don't want to say anything other, uh, more than that. So, has to, has to, ha we have to do something there. That's all from my side. I, I don't have too many uh, other examples. I, mean, I do have a lot of examples, but then, you know, it's a, it's a Pandora box I don't want to open. Do you have questions? I got this number from this lady who was uh, the ex-chief uh, editor of uh, Vogue magazine. This Vogue is a fashion magazine which, uh, yeah, and she, she <laughs> and she told it, uh, I didn't Google it to check, but uh, whatever may be the number, I, for sure I know because I have a lot of friends in Nike and Adidas and they say that the number of t-shirts they produce is, is, in, is in excess of billion for sure. Miss, the whole business model for Zara, yeah, you know that Zara is, uh, is based out of Spain and the whole business model for them is that they make only white t-shirts every, every time and depending upon the season, they just give the color. So th they have a stock of white t-shirts and they just put the colors. Yeah, that's a, get, that's a big case study if you want to do. You can have a Google it or look it for it and they produce in excess and that's the why in the summer you buy this Zara t-shirt at a very cheap price because, you know, they never have to think about the inventory cost, invent, inventory holding cost, because it's, it keeps coming out of the inventory, yeah? It's white t-shirt, bring it out, color it, put some, some, some design. I, I'm not against Jara, yeah? <laughs> I'm just telling you, yeah? Which I can under, understand, because that's a really nice business model. You don't have to think about the inventory cost, in, inventory holding cost, for example. But, yeah, we have such examples. Miss, most of us, I don't know, miss, but most of us will have at least 20, 30 t-shirt or in that range, yeah? And I don't know how many times you wear it. I, I, I'm not looking at girls, yeah? I'm not looking at girls, huh? <laughs> but I'm telling it that how many times you wear it. By the way, Mark Zuckerberg and all these big guys, they always wear the same color t-shirt or, or uh, same t-shirt because they don't want to make a decision every morning what they should wear. That's a different philosophy, yeah? But, yeah, if that's the philosophy and if it still helps to have a fashion diet, why not? <laughs>